making noises again, people. You know what that means. I just watched a crazy, bold, just episode of Star Trek. What's up, everybody? Ganon here, back at it again with another one of my Star Trek reviews. With just one week away from Strange New Worlds, I'm ecstatic that we're getting a new Star Trek series, especially the long-awaited standalone Captain Pike series. But what I'm not excited about is I'm pretty sure that Strange New Worlds is dropping and premiering on the same day that the season finale of Picard is dropping. They're literally going to be dropping probably at the same second, and I'm going to have to choose which to do first that night. Like, I'm going to have to choose between a really important season finale or an extremely important season premiere, and you already know your boy is going to be picking Strange New Worlds. Been waiting for this show my whole entire life. Of course I'm going to review Strange New Worlds first, but I just hate that I have to choose. It just further laments the fact that Paramount Plus is the worst streaming service ever. It looks horrible. It's just ugly. I've not seen another streaming service looks so bad and honestly it just doesn't even work half the time. I've been locked out of my Paramount Plus for about a week now just because I downloaded an ad blocker even though I have cleaned up all my cookies extensions and have basically reset my browser it's still just not working. Disney is not going to drop the season premiere of Moon Knight the exact same second that Boba Fett ends. It just doesn't make any sense. It makes you guys look like absolute clowns who don't know how to drop content. As a consumer as somebody who watches Star Trek and as especially as a YouTuber who reviews it. Nobody wants episodes from different series dropping at the exact same second. It just doesn't make any sense. Literally space them at least a day or a week apart. Also, I pay for the premium package, yet I still get ads for just lame crappy series that I'm never going to watch. If I pay for the most expensive package of your streaming service, I should not get ads, period. Just let me watch my shows. Aside from my frustrations surrounding Paramount Plus as a streaming service, I'm very much obliged and happy to continue consuming and shilling this current season of Picard. It is no surprise to you guys that I am a fan, but with the recent weird misuse of screen time coupled with the fact that even though they're in modern day LA, the sets and settings so far have kind of lacked immersion and have kind of been rather boring, and I feel like a good third of this season at least has taken place just on Chateau Picard, and another third has taken place on La Serena. I'm definitely going to have to have these final two episodes make up for that just very okay FBI interrogation arc that they decided to go with last episode. I mean, there's a billion things that they could have done to fill up the time of last episode, and they went with, uh, yeah, well, that. I am just happy to finally be content and enjoying a Star Trek season again. So with all that being said, let's get into the review. Today, we're reviewing episode nine, the penultimate episode of Star Trek Picard season two titled Hide and Seek. This episode was crazy crazy on so many levels, okay? We got to know some crazy new lore that all of us have just been wondering for years, and especially have been wondering ever since the start of last season of Star Trek Picard. We get to learn some stuff about Seven regarding Starfleet and Janeway and Voyager. It's beautiful that they even reference like Voyager in this episode. Seven references Voyager and Janeway. It just makes me want to cry. Chris Rios has his Edith Keller moment in this episode. He is forced to act actually decide to help Picard and the gang and leave behind his doctor girlfriend. A bunch of stuff happens and then crazy just like universe changing stuff. Just stuff that's going on with the board, stuff that's going on with Agnes that is just like actually universe changing. The scale of what happens in this episode is crazy plus the trauma, the backstory, these hidden secrets that Picard has had in his past life surrounding his parents has come full circle in hide and seek that is where the episode title comes from, Hide and Seek. It, you know, goes back to that little game of Hide and Seek that Picard played with his mother when he was younger. Holy crap, do things just go from zero to 100 in this episode, and I cannot wait to get into it. Let's just get right into it. This episode starts off with Agnes going full board queen. She actually boards the La Serena, kicks Rios and his doctor, Edith Keller, girlfriend off the ship, comes aboard the ship, visits the morgue, and actually assimilates the old body of the Borg Queen and then just goes full Agnes Borg Queen mode on it. She is wearing the Borg Queen dress. She's green tinted and obviously has like nanobots going through her veins. Talene and Picard and them teleport to the scene of La Serena. Rios manages to escape and actually just meets up with them and they all team together. Talene shows up and provides what appears to be Jat Vash weaponry, which in all honesty, is just kind of lazy and wow that 
tells me your show has a crazy budget when you're reusing the same weapon for like the last three scenes in this entire last two seasons that require weapons I've seen a Jot Vosh weapon. I could be wrong. Those really look like the Jot Vosh weapons. Not to mention they weren't even shooting green lasers like they were Romulan weaponry. They were shooting blue lasers, which was just a little bit inappropriate if they were Jot Vosh weapons. I understand that they were fighting mercenaries in this episode in the forest and that they had green Borg lasers and it would have clashed, but it's still just slightly inaccurate. At the beginning of this episode, when the Borg Queen goes up on the Lur Serena, it really looks like she's won the game, that she's got a hold of the ship. They're off the ship and she's really just about to take this go fly somewhere and start assimilating everything in the galaxy. But of course, when we're in this situation when there's like two people in one body, there's two minds in one mind, we have these really corny reoccurring things. Psyches are always going to clash with each other and they're always going to be fighting for control of this physical body. And then second, there's going to be a corny scene in the season or episode where one of the protagonist characters looks at this character and says, I know you're in there. I know you could fight it, bro. Just fight fight it and then of course they don't initially end up fighting it, which ends up having somebody probably getting hurt, which is exactly what happens in this episode. This episode goes at 100 miles per hour, so I'm gonna go at 100 miles per hour, baby. Let's go. Agnes is attempting to resist the Borg Queen in some ways. Initially, she just kind of stops her hand, and then they have this little back-to-back -back monologuing. The Borg Queen finally is just like, hey, screw you, Agnes. I'm actually gonna take control of the ship. Presses the button, but Agnes is like, no, no, no. In the span of maybe like 20 minutes, I've managed to not only create an encryption key, but create an Elnor hologram, which I'm going to use to combat you. Now, the Elnor hologram is, I guess, the writer's and the director's way of utilizing the Elnor actor this episode, and it's really cool to see Elnor go around a ship and battle a whole bunch of Borg mercenaries, but in all honesty, the Elnor hologram is my biggest gripe with this episode. There's a lot of things that's inappropriate. Why is Agnes able to, it, just in the nick of time, very quickly create a hologram of this complexity that not only just totally copies the power level and strength of Elnor and his fighting style, but on top of that has the personality and memories of Elnor to some degree. There's a scene in this episode where the Elnor hologram meets Rafi and he is allowed to act like Elnor. I'm sure they have enough on Elnor on profile for him to act and behave like him, but the hologram literally claims like he has some personality or memories of Elnor up until his final moments, and that for me was just kind of bad. How is Agnes going to develop a hologram that cracked that it literally has the memories of Elnor and is almost like a Elnor ghost that's able to kick mercenary ass? For me, is just a little bit of an interesting decision. There are much more clever ways I imagine that you could have implemented Elnor in. I know we've had the occasional, here's Elnor there, here's Elnor ghost here that Rafi's going crazy and seeing, but but they really decide to go, hey, we really need to use the Elnor actor in this episode. Elnor is dead, so we're just gonna make a hologram. But the hologram was way too OP. It was really doing way too much for me. So Picard and the gang are in a literal war zone fighting over the La Serena. In this war zone, Rios actually ends up getting shot, therefore having Picard ordering Talene to teleport him, the child, and his Edith Keller girlfriend away back to the Watcher room and headquarters. And when they go to the Watcher Talene's house. I really like the design and set. It's very reminiscent of Gary Seven's room from the original series, and I probably mentioned this when it was originally introduced, but it's just a really good looking set. I have to say it again. Rios is now trapped there. Picard wants him staying there with his girlfriend because he's just got a bullet in his shoulder, like a 21st century bullet. Rios could totally keep on assisting them in some way. Basically what happens is that Rios has a couple very cute romantic scenes with the doctor. The doctor helps remove the bullet from his shoulder and then they teleport Rios back at just the right time to help Picard later in the episode. And as Picard and the gang evade Soong and his goons and then they kind of like meet each other, do get this little scene and interaction between Seven and Rafi and it is just absolutely beautiful for many reasons. For one thing, it just kind of implies that Seven may have a future in Starfleet because Rafi just looks at her and says, you would have made such a great captain. You're so awesome and amazing and then Seven lore dumps on us the most important lore dump of this season, I swear to God it is. Just the fact that Seven of Nine as a character is mentioning Voyager and Janeway in the same sentence is insane as a Star Trek fan, and it made me like, <sighs> Seven of Nine is 
Seven says that after they returned from their Voyager voyage that Starfleet was actually not fully comfortable with a Borg joining the ranks and that Janeway was actually super pissed by this and even went and fought for her. But in the end, Seven was not expecting that kind of resistance when she got home. She was going to go there and she's like, oh, I will probably expect resistance because I'm Borg, but she didn't truly like expect it to happen. And when it did, I can just totally imagine her throwing this fit and joining the Fenris Rangers, which she kind of explains is exactly what she did. That is just amazing. Great lore. It was like impeccably placed. The interactions with Rafi and in Seven in this episode are amazing and beautiful. There's the scene where they have like a saving Private Ryan knife duel and they both assist each other in taking down this Borg mercenary and it's a really awesome, well choreographed scene. Except my one criticism is also that the Borg mercenaries are kind of ridiculous. Don't assimilate the mercenaries if they're not really going to behave like Borg. Um, and also I was just confused. Are they all Borg mercenaries or some of them not? Because the one that was fighting Seven and Rafi literally looked like he was fighting like a human Navy SEAL. Nothing Borg-like about him. I honestly do know that the Borg Queen can control uh, thousands of cubes, like literally millions of Borg at a time. Dude, is she really able to hands that hard. The mercenaries just seemed very unborg like Why assimilate them in the first place if the only thing that you're really going to give them to make them feel Borg-like is to just give them green lasers. And another thing, the whole back and forth shooting between Picard's gang and the mercenaries was the lamest, worst part of the episode. It was very not well choreographed. They felt very stormtrooper-y, which is not appropriate for Star Trek. We shouldn't have grunt characters that just shoot shoot empty 30 laser beams and hit nothing. That's meant for Star Wars. It's not really meant for Star Trek. Back to Picard's traumatic flashbacks. We have an amazing scene in this episode with his mother. I just have to say it is given to us the explanation for what actually happened with Picard and his mother in this episode. And I will have to say that it is just so like honestly daring what they decided to do and it was very impactful it just hit it, there is a lot of things that happened in this episode regarding Picard's mother that I just really love there was this scene before they go and explain the really dark part the really gruesome traumatic part about Picard's life she sits down and she has this conversation with Picard about how stars in the sky are merely just echoes of bright lights that once existed millions and millions of years ago when you remember her that you don't remember that echo that star fading away but you just remember your mother burning brightly and it was just so fire like this is just really good dialogue for Trek standards for one thing the actress just did a really good job delivering it it was just amazing I loved a uh, little little P little P card and I loved his the interactions with his mother they were honestly just 10 out of 10 like I'm not gonna give the episode a 10 out of 10 but that hit. The explanation for what happened was explained through Soong's pursuit of Picard through the underground catacombs of Chateau Picard. As Picard and Talene traverse through the catacombs, evading Soong and his men, Picard then is forced to come to terms with a, what actually happened down there and oh my gosh, dude, this is like really dark stuff for Trek. And it is really dark also considering the fact that uh, you have to remember in Star Trek Insurrection it was revealed that Rene Picard, Picard's nephew and his brother burned like alive in a fire, like died horrifically. And it was just one of the darkest moments in all of Star Trek. And we learned in this episode that Picard has to live with also another form of trauma that happened really early in his childhood. When Picard's father went to chase Picard and his mother down in the catacombs, he found them. He found Picard and he eventually found his mother, brought his mother back up, locked her in this room for her own safety. Now, now, Picard's mother was begging Picard to let her out. Young Picard finally gave in and submitted. We see this scene. There's two just amazing top tier, really impactful scenes this episode. When it's finally revealed the fate of Picard's mother, we just get this extremely gruesome, dark image of Picard looking at her. She killed herself and it's just a really dark shot like you just see her doing it. She's hanging there. You could see her face first. You could see her whole face and everything. What's even more cryptic and impactful about the scene is that it's shown in reverse. Like it's insinuating and implying 
trauma. Picard walks slowly away. Picard's mother takes off the noose. It all happens in reverse and she walks back through this corridor into a bed with young Picard. Picard didn't just let her out. He simply just opened the door, went into her room to sleep with her. While Picard was sleeping, she got up and took her own life. And it's just like, whoa. That is like one of the best suicide death scenes I have seen ever. There have been some points in the season where it reminds me of like, okay, this is new track, current Hollywood, just kind of scuffed writing, really interesting decisions. Whenever you're going to do a whole production, usually there's some fried decisions, right? That FBI director episode last episode was a little bit fried it was kind of a waste of time but oh my gosh was there some real scenes in this episode that impressed me uh, after that that second scene i was talking about picard throwing the rock in that observatory and breaking the glass which just goes back just explaining the glass breaking in the opening for the past two seasons god damn did that put me in my feels that was crazy picard uh, then explains which is so important it is so important he explains that he would like to envision his mother growing old with a cup of tea in her hand uh, inviting him for a chat and that explains that one episode of the tos where no man has gone before Harry Matalas! Matalas! Eleanor fights the Borg with a sword he finds, the Eleanor Hologram. It is just a little bit ridiculous how much the Eleanor Hologram is able to achieve in this episode. Seven and Rafi are trying to fight the Borg Queen. The Eleanor Hologram actually beats her asses and is able to subdue her to a certain degree, but the Borg Queen just gets back up and is like, you guys don't have the power to defeat me. Whiplash just like stabs Seven and Nine in the groin. It looks like a mega stab. She looks like she's hella dying. This is the point in the episode where it just kind of like, what? I'm starting to believe that the Borg Queen that appeared on the ship in episode one is literally just Agnes, the past. Like, Agnes has just been the Borg Queen for the past 400 years because what happens in this episode is that after the super stabbing of Seven, Agnes is now inside the mind of the Queen and she's not allowing the Queen to finish off Seven. She then has this conversation with the Queen about how she looked deep into her psyche and she now understands the the queen and she now understands what the Borg are. Psychiatrically attacks the queen and convinces the queen that the Borg always die and diminish in every timeline and that your ways are not working anymore. We need to create a new Borg. What if we created a Borg that instead on assimilation it was actually meant on doing the best of both worlds and helping people and at this point I was starting to think like whoa 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 this is a little bit corny. You're not going to take the most ruthless, vicious faction in all of Star Trek and you're not going to like convince the lady at the top, the Borg Queen, that you should really just be friendly and get along and create good Borg from now on. When I started to hear this, I was like, ah, ah. that's kind of bad. Except the direction that they decided to go with this is that by the end of this episode, we start to realize as a viewer, I start to realize that we're probably not getting Agnes back, okay? Agnes Jurati as a character, I don't think is destined to remain human because at the end of this episode, Agnes and the Borg Queen almost come to some agreement. They meld together. Definitely influenced by Agnes being in the same consciousness, being in the same body to make this decision. Agnes is an extremely smart character. She is like a cybernetic freak. She understands Borg androids and all of these organisms on another level. It would make sense that she would be able to fight the Borg Queen. She would be the one to be able to like make the Borg Queen realize that that's why she's so scared. You're scared of being alone because you realize that the Borg way is just not working. In any timeline, in any instance, in any universe, the Borg always gets slain. It just makes sense to me that Agnes would be the one to do it. It really just seems like, okay, Agnes is now the new and improved Borg Queen. She is going to go out into the current setting with the La Serena, which she stole at the end of the episode by the the way she is going to go and build her own like good nice Borg Empire to maybe compete with like the Borg Empire in the current setting because things come full circle I really honestly believe that Agnes was the Borg Queen at the beginning of the season on the Stargazer also Agnes Borg Queen just reveals some really important information she says that there are two Renees one must live and one must die and like I said before I just think that this is a reference to the fact that the Renee 
Rene Picard, who's supposed to go on the Europa mission, is going to live, and that the Rene Picard that is coming in the future, Picard's nephew, is meant to die. You know, he kind of already has, in a sense. I think that's what Agnes Gerardi Borg Queen means. So, yeah, if Agnes Gerardi simply convinced the Borg Queen to make the Borg good and just for them to go out and change their ways of their own accord and just be compassionate, I would have hated that. And also, if Agnes just left the Borg Queen and they separated after that and Agnes just became, like, a scientist again, I would have hated that so much on so many levels. I'm very happy that with this decision of them changing the Borg and changing their identity, that they include taking almost Agnes's life with that. Like, Agnes Gerardi, as we knew her, is gone. It seems like it's totally a ghost in the shell moment and we have this new entity. This episode was crazy. It was so entertaining. It was a really good penultimate episode. It honestly felt like I was watching a season finale. That being said, there is like a lot of things to nitpick. There was a couple lazy things. There was also some really bad CGI in this episode. For instance, there was a scene where Dr. Soon was talking to Picard and threatening him. He was standing out in the woods with the Borg mercenaries and you could tell that they were using those like 3D immersive screens, those new screens that they use, the really expensive ones. For some reason, Paramount is just really bad at using them because it looks absolutely brilliant whenever Disney uses them, but they really look cheap and disgusting in the Discovery and some of the Picard episodes. Like, you could definitely see it. Also, there was this awesome use of the transporter in this episode where they actually beamed some of the mercenaries into solid rock, which I think is like a use of the transporter, which we've always wanted to see happen, and it's finally happened. It just looked a little bit bad and derpy. So with all that being said, I have been shilling Star Trek Picard. A lot of people have been asking me, why have you been rating Star Trek Picard so high? I have to admit, I have been rating it too high. The past couple episodes, whatever I've given them rating-wise, just knocked them down 1.5. I am going to give this episode an honest good eight. I'm just having fun finally watching Star Trek again. I'm not watching Star Trek content that annoys me. Star Trek Discovery Season 4 is just kind of like the nail in the coffin on Discovery. I used to love Discovery as a show, and their showrunners are actually horrible in running it to the ground. Star Trek Picard is Star Trek. You guys can think that it's bad or whatever, but any way you look at it, this is what I consider Star Trek in its like definition. With all that being said, I really like this episode. I can't wait for the next episode. I'm probably going to review it like the next day after Strange New Worlds. I'm definitely going to focus on Strange New Worlds. It's so important to me. This weekend, I have a video coming out about me making my own Star Trek phaser, so look forward to that. If you enjoy any of the content that you see on the channel, I'd be very flattered if you were to subscribe. When I get to 10K subscribers, I'm going to cosplay as a Star Trek Xenos, and I'll probably like go harass people in public or something. Please leave a comment down below. I love hearing what you guys think. Comments are my favorite thing about this platform. Also, if you'd like to discuss any of the topics that we discuss here on the channel, join my Discord. The link is in the bottom of every video. Hope you guys have a good rest of your week. Live long and prosper. Can I